Dhamma greetings friends. My name is Joe and I'm a student of Bhante Chandana. Uh, Bhante is currently a homeless monk and he's not attached to any uh, monastic organization and he's traveling from places to places, country to country to spread the Dhamma. So if you do find his teachings and his videos helpful, please consider uh, donating at the link below and I hope you have a good day and hope you enjoy the video. Thank you. This week we continue on the Sutta Explorations series and uh, it will be week number 106. And for this week's sutta or discourse, we go back to the Majjhima Nikaya, the middle length discourses, and specifically to sutta number 134. For today's sutta, I chose a very uh, unique sutta which happens to be repeated, at least the essence of it, four times over, back to back. It's a highly unusual sutta. To this day, scholars are baffled as to why the compilers of the canon of the first council chose to include these four suttas, specifically the ones um, in Pali, the term is Bhadde Karatta Sutta. Even the translation in English, there's much debating that's been going on for almost 70, 80 years between scholars, commentators, as to what the term Bhadde Karatta means. Some have used one fine night or one delightful night, ratta. Uh, but it's much more complex than that. When one, we, one dives into trying to research as to the roots, as to how this term bhadde karata is, is come, you know, developed. And why did Lord Buddha use this term? Now, we have covered this sutta, or oh, actually the Bhadde Karata, in one of these four versions, specifically the Mahakachana Bhadde Karata Sutta, a few years ago. But given its significance, I wanted us to go back to it because it has so much to offer us so much to offer the practitioner. The translation of the term in English, I have chosen to go with the version that was uh, used after much consideration by the late Venerable Katukurunde Nyanananda, who has um, discussed extensively this term, as well as he has written a, a booklet on this sutta, specifically the Mahakachana Bhadde Karata Sutta, which he terms as the ideal lover of solitude. The ideal lover of solitude. To me, it makes much more sense as well, because there's a term eka, which comes from the term uh, eka vihari, which is to live alone. So there's a solitude there. Ratta is a term for delight, uh, for um, also night from Pali. But when we look at it contextually, we see it being referred to basically 
an individual who has come to appreciate deeply the value of solitude. Solitude of one's practice. Not necessarily of simply isolating oneself, because there's also that uh, misconception. This is not a, the term here for solitude. It's, it, it need not give us the impression that this is uh, somehow trying to have us be or become more introverted necessarily. But we'll, we'll get into that in a minute. However, this is the 134th, which is the fourth, the last of the Bhadde Karattas series. And it has to do with this one particular bhikkhu named Loma Sakangiya. And uh, it's, it's a lovely uh, series of events that had taken place. And there is this protagonist um, playing in the background, uh, playing a role that is in the background. And the protagonist, this character, happens to be not Loma Sakangia, but a friend of his from a past life, a fellow bhikkhu from a past life, who had become a deva at the time of Loma Sakangia being a human. He was born as a deva. Now, uh, recently I have translated, uh, I began translating the Theragatas, the verses of the elder Arahants, and I came across a verse from this venerable and how he uh, went forth. So um, before I begin our sutta for today, there, it's a very short verse um, because it comes from the, the first book of the Theragatas, which are only one basic verse series. And um, I'd like to share that, which I recently translated. So um, it's from the Loma Sakangya Thera Theragata number 1.27 and just to give you a background because they all um, are playing an integral place they have a place they have their own unique contextual rich presence that needs to be um, also explored not just taking them as compartments like okay we're going to talk about this sutta that's it uh, in a, as if in a vacuum. Nothing of the Dhamma has happened in a vacuum. Nothing will ever, similarly with our own practice and understanding of the Dhamma. So they all reflect, they all are having something to say about the whole, to, to give us a bigger picture, as it were. Loma, his name, comes from Loma Sakangia, comes from the fact that he was very much uh, born and raised in a very comfortable environment. Some time ago, uh, a few years ago, we covered Sona Sutta, if you recall. And Venerable Sona was also uh, the son of a rich family. He was the only son. And in the text, we see how the compilers had described that even the bottom of his feet, he hadn't walked. So there was tiny little hair growing at the bottom of his feet because everywhere he went, servants would carry him around so that he doesn't get tired from walking. And he was, in the case of Venerable Sona, Earlier in his life, he enjoyed playing the veena, which is type of a, a harp, a sitar, um, um, a much smaller size, I think, than a sitar. But 
when he became a bhikkhu, he put so much aditana and effort on his chankama path, he kept walking back and forth, back and forth, back and forth until his feet bled because he was not used to it. And in fact, his parents had advised him against becoming a bhikkhu because his level of urgency had been so intense. He knew that this was it. He cannot take it for granted, the fact that he's rich or something. No. He wanted out. He wanted to make the most of this life. So he became a bhikkhu. But he was pushing himself too much, too fast, too soon. And Lord Buddha came the next morning and saw his path and he saw all the blood covered path. And he says, What's, what happened here? The bhikkhu said, oh, Bhante, it was, it was Venerable Sona. He, I think he's, he, he, he overdid it. So Lord Buddha goes and describes to him that this path is a middle path. And he gives him that quintessential, uh, beautiful image of the vena. He says, Sona, you used to play the vena, right? And he says, yes, Bhante. And he says, how did you play the vena? How did you string? You know, how did you pull the string of the, of the vena? Was it too, in, too tight? He says, no, Bhante, if it were too tight, it would snap. How about if it was too, too, too loose? And he says, oh, Bhante, then you wouldn't be able to play any tune. He says, ah. Earlier, he said, you were enjoying a luxurious life as a prince. But now you've become a bhikkhu and you're pushing yourself too fast, too soon, too much. Pull back a little. He understood because of his connection with the playing of that lovely instrument called the veena. And he says, yes, Bhante. And Lord Buddha uh, assigned for us bhikkhus from that moment on the flexibility, shall we say, when it comes to walking barefoot. You, because up until then, bhikkhus were supposed to walk barefoot. And Lord Buddha made an exception for all those bhikkhus who are not used to walking or have sensitive feet. He said, you can go ahead, wear sandals. Even though uh, he uh, had a hard, a hard time, uh, Venerable Sona, accepting that, even though it came straight from Lord Buddha himself, because he said, Bhante, but you're allowing me to do that. I'm becoming an exception, but that's not fair for the remainder of the bhikkhus. They might look at this situation as a favoritism. And so Lord Buddha said, you need to wear some, you know, some protection on your feet because you need to do some work still. Continue your practice. But anyhow, the reason why I brought in Venerable Sona into this, our discussion, because, is because Loma also means fine hair. body hair, which was growing at the bottom of Venerable Sona's feet. But uh, some have said that Venerable Loma Sakangiya was also uh, given that name because of the fact that he was very much pampered. Now, uh, Venerable Loma Sakangiya, before he becomes a Venerable, his urgency arises in him. And he goes and rushes to Lord Buddha asking for ordination to become a bhikkhu. And back then we had instituted, Lord Buddha had instituted for the bhikkhus that no, bhikkhu, no person can become ordained as a bhikkhu unless they uh, received the permission from their parents. And Lord Buddha asks him, Loma, did you go get your parents' permission? And he says, no, Bhante, I didn't know that. And he says, you must go and get your permission. So he goes to his mother because his father apparently had died or not around. And uh, she tells him, she basically tries to warn him that, my son, you've been very well protected. Living life of, of, of a bhikkhu, you're going to be in the wilderness. You're going to live in a kuti. You're going to walk barefoot. You're going to have only one meal a day. How will you manage? You're going to walk through the jungle. And there's going to be twigs and sharp 
thorny bushes and things that you're going to scrape your body against and you're going to bleed who's going to take care of you how will you sleep on a, on a, on a, on, a, on the ground so all these things she threw at him basically compassionately just to kind of warn him and uh, later on when venerable lomo sakangi became an arahant he remembered uh, these verses uh, that his mom gave him so the one that uh, I have here translated is his response to his mother when he was full of aditana, of the determination. Appamada, that willingness, the heatfulness to go forth. He was set. He said, I just need your approval, your permission. That's it. Don't worry about everything else. And he said these words to his mom. I will pierce through sharp twigs and razor like kusa grass. Kusa grass are very nasty, uh, like grass. They're tall grass. They can be taller than six, seven feet. And if you hold them in a certain way, they, they're like razors. They will cut you. When I used to live in the big island of Hawaii, uh, there were so many of those all around the ed, you know, on the road. So a few times I had to, it, it bled basically because it looks so soft, this and that, and you hold it the wrong way, it cuts you. It's like a razor. So he says, I will pierce through sharp twigs and razor like kusa grass, along with anything that stand in my way, whether it be creeping vines or thorn bush that easily cut and break into the soft skin. I will push my way through with my bare chest, tossing them all aside as I do what's necessary for me while living alone, devoting myself to renouncing and develop in utter seclusion. Well, having said this, his mom sees in his eyes the determination and she says, I give you my permission, my son. You may go ahead and do what you want to do. And he goes and he tells Lord Buddha, Bhante, I have my mother's permission. So now this sutta, we're back to Majjhima Nikaya 134, which is today's sutta. Aloma Sakangiya Bhante Karatta Sutta. Here we see um, an encounter that took place between the deva that I was mentioning uh, who happened to be a friend of his from a past life, and Venerable Loma Sakangiya, and the series of events that will take place afterwards. So let us uh, begin. I have personally heard this. At one time, the Blessed One was living at the monastery offered to him by the lay supporter Anatta Pindika in Jeta's Park in the city of Savati. It was during that time that the Venerable Loma Sakangiya was living at the Nigrodha Monastery in the Sakyan royal city of Kapilavatu, the same city where Lord Buddha was from as Siddhartha Gautam. Then in the second watch of the night, the glorious Deva by the name of Chandana appeared as he completely illuminated the Nigrodha Monastery dispersing the entire darkness of the night with his brilliance, and began approaching the venerable Loma Sakangiya as he came and stood to one side and addressed the venerable by saying, Bhikkhu, do you recall the verses of the ideal lover of solitude and its detailed explanation? No, friend. I neither recall the verses of the ideal lover of solitude nor its detailed explanation. That was the response from Venerable Loma Sakangiya to the Deva. And the Venerable Loma Sakangiya in turn asked the radiant Deva, but how about you, friend? Do you recall it? The Deva replied, Bhikkhu, I must say that unfortunately, I also neither recall the verses of the ideal lover of solitude nor its detailed explanation. 
The Deva then continued by asking further. Then, Bhikkhu, how about just the verses of the ideal lover of solitude? Don't you remember any part of it? Venerable Loma Sakangi responded by saying, No, friend. I must say, I do not recall any of the verses of the ideal lover of solitude. And he continued by asking the glorious Deva. But friend, can't you recall any of the verses of the ideal lover of solitude? It's interesting, you know, back and forth. At this, the Deva replied by saying, Yes, Bhikkhu, I believe I can recall just the verses of the ideal lover of solitude. And what do the verses say or declare, friend? Asked the Venerable Loma Sakangiya, and the radiant Deva said, I remember one time, Bhikkhu, while the Blessed One was visiting the Tavatinsa Devas of the 33. He sat on the red marble stone under the root of the great Parichataka tree. It was then that the Blessed One began reciting the verses of the ideal lover of solitude, after which he expounded on them, giving detailed explanation to those 33 devas of Tavatinsa, gathered to listen to the Blessed One, as he instructed them by saying, so here we'll follow the verses of the ideal lover of solitude, the Baddei Karatta. So these were the words that he recalls from Lord Buddha's mouth while he was in the Tavantinsa heaven, the, this Deva. Do not resuscitate the past, nor tie yourself to hopes or be anxious about what may lie in the future. For the past is over and done with, while the future has not yet arrived. However, those things that keep arising in the present, he goes on discerning them all with penetrating insight while they occur. The one who is indeed unagitated, unwavering in his resolve, he maintains the course of wisdom, steadfast. Today is the time for the work to be done. Tomorrow, it may very well be too late, as death might already be here. For no bargain can be struck with death and its mighty armies. But for him who lives working untiring, untiringly both day and night, it is he whom the tranquil sage has called the ideal lover of solitude. This, Bhikkhu, is how I recall the verses of the ideal lover of solitude. Now, Bhikkhu, you must memorize these verses and recall them often, as well as learn their detailed meaning and explanation. You must closely keep these verses in your heart wherever you are and whatever you may do. This, because the ideal lover of solitude is absolutely essential to truly living and understanding the very foundation of the holy life. Now these were the words uttered by Chandana, the glorious Deva, who disappeared after speaking these words. Then, immediately after this visitation, the Venerable Loma Sakangiya put his dwelling place in order. And by the early morning, he left his kuti while taking his alms bowl and outer robe with him as he set off on his journey towards Savati to see the Blessed One. Traveling by stages, because it was far from Kapilavatu to Savati, several, I think it's over 100 miles, if not more, Traveling by stages, the Venerable Loma Sakangiya finally reached Savati as he went to the Blessed One and worshipped him by offering his respects and then sat to one side. Then he reported to the Blessed One his encounter with the glorious Deva while adding, Bhante, could you please teach me the verses of the ideal lover of solitude as well as its detailed meaning by explaining them to me? And the Blessed One said to the Venerable Loma Sakangiya, But Bhikkhu, did you recognize or know who that Deva was? 
nobody I did not recognize, nor do I know that Deva. That Deva's name, Bhikkhu, is Chandana. Remember this, Bhikkhu. Chandana, the Deva, pays wise and careful attention, applying himself correctly with diligence, as he wholeheartedly dedicates himself to the Dhamma. By paying full attention and then putting all his energy into his practice according to the Dhamma, as he has attentively listened to and learned it. Now, Bhikkhu, you must also listen carefully to what I shall say and pay close attention, for I will teach you the verses and give you the detailed explanation of the ideal lover of solitude. Yes, Bhante, replied the Venerable Loma Sakangiya. Now, what we do not see in the sutta, which we get from the commentaries, is this lovely background story that tells us about the relationship between Chandana the Deva and Venerable Loma Sakangiya. You see, they were both alive and practicing bhikkhus at the time of the previous Lord Buddha, Buddha Kassapa. And just like Lord Buddha was giving the Baddekaratta teaching in this life, Back then, a few eons earlier, Lord Buddha Kassapa was giving the Badde Karatta Sutta to the assembly of bhikkhus. Now, Loma Sakangiya was present, as was the Deva Chandana. He wasn't a Deva then, he was also a bhikkhu. He was a human being. So they were very close friends. Now, he's so touched Loma Sakangya, in hearing the Bhante Karatta teaching from Lord Buddha Kassapa, he says, Ah, I wish one day I will be able to say the verses of the Bhante Karatta. I wish that one day I also am able to explain it and elaborate it. This ideal lover of solitude sutta, the verses. And his friend, who became Chandana Dadeva, turns to him and says, you know what? I wish I become that person who reminds you of it, who asks you the question, hey, Loma, do you remember Bandekaratta Sutta? I wish I will be also present and in existence or know you somehow, have some connection with you to come to you and incite you, encourage you, so you get to remember the Badde Karatta. And here we have that situation taking place. Except that Chandana is not a human being, he's a deva. Nevertheless, he ended up coming and he was very developed in his practice, but still a deva. He wasn't an arahant. He came and he encouraged his friend to remember, who had completely forgotten. Loma had forgotten about Dekaratta. And now he's hearing it, both from Chandana, his past friend, and especially by Lord Buddha, who now is going to elaborate the whole Dekaratta in detail. and the significance as to why it's important to be living the holy life. So he says, yes, Bhante, the Venerable Loma Sakangya and the Blessed One continued speaking. Do not resuscitate the past, nor tie yourself to hopes or be anxious about what may lie in the future. For the past is over and done with, while the future has not yet arrived. However, those things that keep arising in the present he goes on discerning them all with penetrating insight while they occur. The one who is indeed unagitated, unwavering in his resolve, he maintains the course of wisdom steadfast. Today is the time for the work to be done. Tomorrow, it may very well be too late, as death might already be here. For no bargain can be struck with death and its mighty armies. But for him who lives working untiringly both day and night, it is he 
whom the tranquil sage has called the ideal lover of solitude. And now Lord Buddha is going to expand, open each of these up. And how do you resuscitate the past? By reflecting with delight and passion on how, in the past, the eyes made contact with pleasing and enjoyable visible objects and sights. And as a result, there arises consciousness that is bound up with delight and passion for such sights, which traps one in the nostalgia and longing for the recurrence of such pleasurable experiences from the past. In this manner, you resuscitate the past. So, visible objects that we see with the eyes, those are called eye consciousness. Each of those incidents of encounter between the eye and pleasurable sights. What's happening there? If the mind is doing its thing, going on automatic pilot, what naturally, quote unquote, develops is because of the absence of sati, there develops the feeling of coziness, delight, enjoyment, passions arise. Why? Because of the recollection of that visual, pleasurable visual sight. In this way, we resuscitate the past. By reflecting with delight and passion on how, in the past, the ears made contact with pleasing and enjoyable sounds. And as a result, there arises consciousness that is bound up with delight and passion for such sounds, which traps one in the nostalgia and longing for the recurrence of such pleasurable experiences from the past. In this manner, you resuscitate the past. Every time we're looking at a picture, a family photograph, or a trip that you were on, you went somewhere, an event of that took place. All these are wonderful exercises to see whether we are fishing for delightful experiences to be recaptured, to be relived. Meanwhile, we know that that moment is dead and gone. The persons in the picture are gone. Or it would take a miracle to get all these different people to come back and to get at that shot again. But they've all changed. Many of them have gray hair or they are no longer present. So here we see the visual, then we see the auditory. Let's see what comes after. Remember, Lord Buddha is using the six sense basis. And this comes from the collection of analysis, the suttas within the Majjhima Nikaya, past 130 Majjhima Nikaya, where it is all about analyses. We see specific instructions in specific suttas, beautiful suttas that are at the tail end of the Majjhima Nikaya showing up in this group of analysis, suttas or discourses in which we find the Baddekarata, where we see the importance that needs to be given to the sixth sense basis, because there is no awakening without understanding the sixth sense basis and their relationship with living life with sati. So it's not just be present now type of a thing. No, there needs to be an understanding as to what is taking place. There needs to be discernment. Wisdom must show up. It's never going to come through a book. It's going to come through us looking at, carefully, at the six sense bases, the organs, the spheres, the connection between them, the eye, the visible object, and what's happening in between, and what is it generating in us? By reflecting with delight and passion on how in the past the nose made contact with pleasing and enjoyable scents and fragrances, 
And as a result, there arises consciousness that is bound up with delight and passion for such smells, which traps one in the nostalgia and longing for the reoccurrence of such pleasurable experiences from the past. In this manner, you resuscitate the past. What do we resuscitate? Somebody who's lost life. If you've ever done CPR, there's mouth to mouth, to mouth resuscitation, they say. There's compressions, chest compressions. Uh, one very disturbing thing that happens in the US, in America, is that when a person has died, and it's been over an hour or two or more, and no matter what age the person belonged to, let's say somebody's in their late 90s, or they were on, you know, they were struggling with life, you know, they're just maintaining life, that is. And somebody, some loved one, or somebody sees them, oh, they must have died, and they're blue or something. They, they must have died for hours, let's say. I say this because it has happened to individuals that I personally know. And so what they do, proper procedure is, you need to let the authorities know. So if you're in America, you would call 911, and what they will do is they will send paramedics or fire department shows up for some reason, and they come in, and guess what they do? Despite the fact that that person had died for hours, or there's not even like a half a centimeter of flesh on their body, so they're just bone and skin, what they will do is they will put the person on the floor, and quickly engage in CPR. That means chest compressions. That might also include mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. I had a close friend whose, whose mom had died and she was in her late 90s and she was struggling back and forth from hospital and almost like hospice care. So he thought, okay, now is the time. My mom had died for, you know, 15, 20 minutes. We know the doctors told us she's going to die. So they called the paramedics to come and take the body so they can start the procedure, right? They come into his surprise and shock. They threw his mother, 90 plus year old lady, on the ground and they started jumping on her with. Grown men with certifications and licenses and hopefully not at the, in the absence of conscience and logic and common sense, trying to resuscitate the dead corpse of this old human being. And you cannot interfere because they will arrest you. They will yell at you, you who have just lost a loved one complete absence of decency, integrity. Well, this is part of the resuscitation. Also, when I see that, resuscitating the dead body, that's what we're also trying to do. It's vulgar, it's ugly. When we're trying to look at a picture or an event that took place and trying to somehow infuse it with life, you can't, it's dead. But we don't stop and pause and to, to consider these things. What am I doing? What am I doing? I'm looking for a feeling. I'm looking for a feeling to be somehow revived. But the moment had gone, you know, like it, would have, it happened maybe 12 years ago, seven months and 13 days and 24 or 22 hours earlier. Who cares? It's done. I am here because. It comes at the cost of what is happening now. That's why in the verses, Lord Buddha is bringing the attention back to today. Don't worry about tomorrow. Don't worry about the past. Resuscitating the past. If it had any legitimacy, it must have done something, hopefully a good thing to you, for you. And let's move on. Today's life is based on the decisions you've made back then. So don't go back. You won't find life there.
Sati won't be there. Sati can only happen here. Sila can only happen here. Mental cultivation, bhavana can only happen here. Don't talk to me about, yes, I had this epiphany. I had this moment. I had this jhanic experience back then, this attainment. And what happened since then, my friend? Where is all that? Where is the dhamma? By reflecting with delight and passion on how in the past the tongue made contact with pleasing and enjoyable flavors and tastes, and as a result, there arises consciousness that is bound up with delight and passion for such flavors, which traps on in the nostalgia and longing for the recurrence of such pleasurable experiences from the past. In this manner, you resuscitate the past. So Lord Buddha has now gone through all the, almost all senses. So now he's getting to the body by reflecting with delight and passion on how in the past the body made contact with pleasing and enjoyable touches and tactile experiences. And as a result, there arises consciousness that is bound up with delight and passion for such tactile experiences, which traps one in the nostalgia and longing for the reoccurrence of such pleasurable experiences from the past. In this manner, you resuscitate the past. So nostalgia has everything to do with attach, attaching ourselves, being stuck, glued to some version of non-reality. Some version of something that in our mind has taken place, which if you give it some time, it will start being smeared and brushed over by what we hoped might have, would have, could have, should have occurred. In reality, if there was a camera taking pictures or video footage of it, and you replay that moment, let's say, oftentimes it's different than what we presumed it or believed it to be. Perfect example is childhood memories that we have, or the spaces, the geographic locations where we grew up, spent time, like the stairs or hallways, corridors, for a child, it might look like it was huge. You're running through, I don't know, the hallways of the Vatican or something. And then later on, later on, let's say you go, excuse me, back to that location and you feel like your shoulders are about to touch the walls. They're not as wide, those streets. They feel like they're narrow, 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 smaller. But I believe I remember them being much bigger much bigger than this because things are smudged painted over by how we felt so it has nothing to do with the memory itself but how we felt the feeling is what needs to be looked at because that's what nostalgia is trying to recapture that feeling in the case of something that we want to resuscitate, of course, if it's something that's the opposite, meaning something we don't like, that's also feeling, right? That won't be nostalgia. That would be pushing away. That would be more in line with trauma. But in essence, the attachment is the same. The intensity of the glueness of it. You can't cut yourself free from that so long as you're going about it the wrong way, like this. By reflecting with delight and passion on how in the past the mind made contact with pleasing and enjoyable thoughts, ideas, and other mental states, as a result, there arises consciousness that is bound up with delight and passion for such mental states, which traps one in the nostalgia and longing for the reoccurrence of such pleasurable experiences from the past. In this manner, you resuscitate the past. Therefore, Bhikkhu, it is in this way that one resuscitates the past. Now, the encouragement here is not to, or not trying to address um, this ability that we have of recollecting or having memories of the past. That is not the problem. Memories are not the issue. Because over time, there have been people, characters who came up like um, Western and Eastern, if you want to think of it like that, uh, 
like Krishnamurti from the East would come up and, and say, oh, memories are things that, you know, they're basically the villains, but they're not. They're just a capacity of the brain. If you have a normal brain, you're going to have memories, okay? If you have a functioning brain, if you have a mind, uh, it will have mind objects. So our job is not to fight with those mind objects, but to see, just like in the case of Chitta Sutta, uh, when the lay person, uh, um, uh, the Upasaka, who was teaching the bhikkhus on what is tanha, what is craving, he gave the example of the white ox and the black ox, which are joined by a yoke. And he said, which one is pulling the other ox? Is it the white ox? They said, no, it's, you know, is it the blue, the white ox? No, it's not. Well, what is it then? Well, they're attached to the, on the neck with the yoke. Well, that is the craving. Similarly, the white ox, uh, he was using, uh, we can think of it as the objects that bring up desire. Let's say vi uh, visual objects. And the black ox would be, let's say, the eyes that would pick up the visual objects. But neither of these two are the problem. The problem is having the craving for this. That's the yoke. So similarly here, the memories themselves are not, the memories of the past are not the issue, nor is recollecting, because these are normal things for us to have. What the problem is, however, is that we have this drive to retrace, to go back, to attach ourselves, to cling on to the past. That drive has to be eliminated, Lord Buddha is saying. That's the tendency of wanting to resuscitate, from which we need to detach ourselves. Otherwise, if you have a brain, if you have a mind, you're going to have mind objects. And that's a question that comes up a lot with students. What should I do, Bhante? Should I? Don't engage. Watch, observe, see. That's not your... You don't need to explain it logically, fight, debate with that mind object, or blame yourself for having it in the first place. Otherwise, you are playing table tennis with Mara. You're stuck. So, and how do you not resuscitate the past, Lord Buddha asks. So this is what Lord Buddha is advising Loma Sakangiya to be doing. By not reflecting with delight nor passion on how in the past the eyes made contact with pleasing or enjoyable visible objects and sights. As a result, the consciousness does not arise that would otherwise be bound up with delight or passion for such sights. And thus, one does not get trapped in the nostalgia or longing for the recurrence of such pleasurable experiences from the past. In this manner, you do not resuscitate the past. You understand that there's this natural order to things. This is anicca. There's nothing like uh, um, uh, some divine entity out there is out to get me or trying to make me lose my memories or my body or my loved ones who stop coming to visit me, let's say, when I'm in a nursing home or I'm in my old house. Everybody moved away and I'm left here by myself. I'm the only person from my generation living in this old neighborhood. So elderly people are living as ghosts in the present, hoping that those things could somehow return to them. But they know deep down that that is asking for the impossible. But what does that place them in? Pain, more dukkha. However, if that person understood the fact of anicca, that all things are changing. In fact, if we had gone 100 years earlier, when they were just a tiny, puny little baby, and the other old lady over there across the street, 
who no one was coming to visit, she was living that hell, which by the way, was no hell for her because she was enjoying going from one person's lap to the other, playing with toys and games and this loved ones all around. So you can think of it as relative. But for that person who identifies with that reality, now I am an old lady or I'm an old man. Ah, oh, it's so unfair. My knees don't work my knees don't work instead of thinking well if you're born if you eat well this and that you're protected this and that so your bones are going to be strong for some time you might even participate in the olympic games and win but eventually those knees will not work i'm sorry even michael phelps who won i don't know 1500 gold medals i don't know sooner or later he won't be able to swim Probably he stopped, I don't know. But he won't be able to function at that level. What is that? That's the bell curve. Anicca. Why should I just look at the peak? <laughs> See, the, the drive to want to attach to one thing versus the other, that is ignorance. That is avijja. That is not accepting reality. That is not wise. That is the way of thinking of a putujjana, Lord Buddha repeatedly says throughout the sutta. And a putujjana is going to be prone to experience more and more dukkha because of their tendency to want to relive the joyous or pleasurable past. While, you know, uh, wide out while using a wide out to erase those things that they don't like to have happened well life doesn't work like that it's immature to say the least by not reflecting with delight nor passion on how in the past the ears made contact with the with pleasing and enjoyable sounds as a result consciousness does not arise that would otherwise be bound up with delight or passion for such sounds and thus, one does not get trapped in the nostalgia or longing for the reoccurrence of such pleasurable experiences from the past. In this manner, you do not resuscitate the past. By not reflecting with delight nor passion on how in the past the nose made contact with pleasing or enjoyable smells or fragrances. As a result, consciousness does not arise that would otherwise be bound up with delight or passion for such smells. And thus, one does not get trapped in the nostalgia or longing for the reoccurrence of such pleasurable experiences from the past. In this manner, you do not resuscitate the past. So when we're thinking about the past, of course, uh, or referring to the past, we're talking essentially about re recollecting, which is another word for sati. Sati is also one of the definitions in English is to remember, to recollect to recall, to bring back to mind. But what we also forget to consider is that memories don't necessarily have to do with thoughts. They're not always about thoughts. Memories have everything to do with the other senses as well. Some more alive than your thought memories, such as, a smell, a distinct smell of something, let's say uh, a grandmother's cooking or, or somebody, uh, you know, making a, a special cake or pie or bread. Smelling of something that really captures for you so many emotional tones. That smell is a memory. Touch, physical touch. Nobody thinks about these things for some reason. We always presume that when we say memory, we're thinking about thought slash memories. When, and when we're for forgetting about the body, specifically the six sense bases, the spheres. Sound, we forget how important sound is. As a memory, a bundle of memories. And all it takes is just one tiny little snippet of a sound, and all of a sudden, 
you go ahead and start to put the pieces together as it were. And then the thoughts come in. What happened? Or taste, taste buds. So when we are talking about resuscitating the past, it cannot come at the exclusion of the other five senses. Other five, because we only think about memories as thoughts. So I'm, I'm trying to say, let's include the whole series of six senses in that plethora of memories, because that's how we live. We don't live just with thought memories, so long as we have occupied this body. And this is one of the problems that Ketas have when they die, because the body isn't there. Physical body is not there. They have a different body in a sense, but it only is happening because of the connection to these six senses that they had had in the past while occupying a physical body. But because of their attachment to such a realm, now they're always in misery, in a shock, because they don't understand how to connect the two, because they have the memory of inhabiting a physical body, but the physical body isn't there anymore. So they reach for a smell whose memory they have, a sound of loved ones, even if it is hundreds or thousands of years earlier. And that's why we make offerings and we transfer merits and the only beings who can accept the rewards of our merits, which we're sharing, the best ones, the only ones, I think, as far as the suttas are concerned, also explain this in that way, are the petas, the miserable ghosts, because they are still recalling their memories of their loved ones who and they don't they don't understand the concept of time so for them their relatives are here somewhere and how come they're not coming and offering making offerings for them because they need them they need food they need care they need to be thought about but their loved ones had died and gone or reborn completely forgotten who they were. Maybe they're in a different realm. And that must have been hundreds of thousands of years ago in some cases. For that, we need to practice generosity and really open up our merits to be shared with all petas, many of whom are orphaned, miserable ghosts. Orphaned because they don't have any loved ones left on this planet who would remember them. So it's a miserable place uh, to be reborn. And one of the major factors that make it very miserable for such beings is the presence of memories associated with their past body. Sounds, smells, tastes, touches, and they can't touch things. It's, it's, it's hell, in a sense. It's higher than the hell realms, but it is still hell. It's better than the worst of, you know, hellish realms. But nevertheless, that doesn't mean that they're not suffering terribly every single day. Just to have in the back of your mind as to how far we can actually look at this resuscitating part. Because it doesn't stop here at the end of your life. If I have a tendency to want to resuscitate the past and try to recapture the past, when that moment of my death arrives and I'm still holding on, on to that nostalgia, guess what? It's going to be dragging me to the next birth or births. Now you can get a bigger perspective of what this terrible thing called samsara is. So how I live my life now has everything to do with how I end up in the next, no matter what I believe to be the case. By not reflecting with delight nor passion on how in the past the tongue made contact with pleasing or enjoyable flavors and tastes, as a result, consciousness does not arise that would otherwise be bound up with delight or passion for such flavors. That's why we have to develop viraga, which is dispassion or the fading away of passion 
you're not jolted up. You're not tossed around when things don't go your way. And that's why we practice sati. While you're practicing sila, so sila can tell you, hey, I know you're practicing awareness, but you do know that we cannot break this precept. Okay, all right, all right, okay. Sati, precept, sati, sila, sila, sati. Okay, they work hand in hand. Okay, I'm feeling more and more rested. Less agitation comes in. So in that sense, sila can also protect you in that sense. And sati is also protecting your sila. So I hope you're able to connect these uh, as I as I endeavor to show you from different sides as to how we can look at this sutta and these teachings, these wonderful teachings of Lord Buddha, by not reflecting with delight or nor passion on how in the past the body made contact with pleasing or enjoyable touches and tactile experiences. As a result, consciousness does not arise that would otherwise be bound up with delight or passion for such tactile experiences. And thus, one does not get trapped in the nostalgia or longing for the reoccurrence of such pleasurable experiences from the past. In this manner, you do not resuscitate the past. By not reflecting with delight nor passion on how in the past the mind made contact with pleasing or enjoyable thoughts, ideas, and other mental states, as a result, consciousness does not arise that would otherwise be bound up with delight or passion for such mental states. And thus one does not get trapped in the nostalgia or for the reoccurrence of such pleasurable experiences from the past. There are beings in the Rupa Lokas who uh, or the levels of Brahma uh, Lokas who are so much in love with thoughts. They're beyond sensuality. They don't care about sensuality. For them, mind, objects, ideas, thoughts, are everything. So they're attached. For that reason of their having that attachment, they end up being dragged to the Brahma realms, where they'll end up for many, many eons, lost in their thoughts. You probably have met people in your life, maybe professors, university, or, or even yourself reading books. We love our ideas. That's a great idea. I have to jot this down. Yeah. Oh, that's a beautiful idea. I wonder if I can share this on social media or write a book on it or write some thesis or dissertation on this. It's nonsense. It's about life at best. And anything that is about something, it is not the thing. It's about it. That's why books about the Dhamma are not the Dhamma. Forget it. It's a miserable, terrible waste of time. Use the suttas. Don't be lost in, you know, commentaries, this and that, and this bhikkhu, that bhikkhu saying this about this sutta. Drop it. Take the sutta. Maybe get a few ideas and say, hmm, let me go to the laboratory and test it out. And that's called bhavana. That is meditation. That is your life when you're doing sila, samadhi, panya. Is it happening? Okay, then you're on the right track. If it's not happening, you are lost in your thoughts about the Dhamma. And usually it involves worshipping some teacher. Why? Why can't you be your own teacher? The best teacher is Lord Buddha. In the, it is in this manner, Bhikkhu, that one does not resuscitate the past. So remember, sati is simply a mechanism for remembering or recollecting to understand the linking up of different living experiences. Right? What's happening here? As I walked into this room, which foot or which leg entered the room first? That involves sati, that involves remembering. So slowly, slowly, you speed it up, you get faster and faster at catching it so that even before you put one foot forward, you already are looking at the mind and the intention. The chetana, before it even develops, you're watching it because there's quiet in the mind. 
that means that your sati has become maha sati. And you're seeing your foot. Oh, yes, I see you. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, but we have to start from somewhere, which involves remembering, recollecting these snapshots, diff different frames of life taking place. And Lord Buddha talks about this in the Anguttara Nikaya extensively, where he says you, he understands uh, things from a moment ago, he understands things that have happened from a long time ago in relation to someone who's practicing sati properly. Uh, so Lord Buddha is not saying don't resuscitate the past. This is an answer to those new agey thinkers, you know, 90s and whatnot, who would say, oh, just be here now, forget about everything. No, this is not some quasi-amnesiac state or some schizophrenic world of, yeah, just, you know, moment-to-moment -moment existence, you know, be like Zen, like a samurai, you know, no, those are all nonsense. And when it comes to the Dhamma proper, we need to understand the connection of the past with the present, with the future. We have to have rational thinking. We have to understand our place in this action that I am committing, in this kamma. So we're not trying to delete memories either or ignore wrongful behaviors whether it's from us or from some other people. In the past, I've had individuals who came to me as people, let's say, who might have wronged me. And I would say, of course, I forgive them, but uh, I'm not going to go in and, and just wholeheartedly accept them uh, like that. Uh, there needs to be emotion. There needs to be an effort on the on the part of the other person that tells me this person is realizing their mistake first. But as far as the apology goes, you know, once I receive it, it's immediate. There's no like delay. I'm not going to make them like, you know, experience pain. We learned this from Lord Buddha himself. So we cannot like forget and, and move on type of a thing. Well, if you do, you're putting yourself and the other person in harm's way. So this is not about deleting memories again. This is about understanding our relationship. So uh, because ultimately you need to have an awareness that is ongoing, accessible at all times and available to you so that you can gain more understanding. Instead of being captured in the wanting to relive through the delight and nostalgia of something that has happened in the past. The good old days. There's no such thing as good old days. It's always happening. They're old, they're gone. Anicca. So in order for us to fully eradicate conceit and thus end suffering, craving itself has to be cut off. Craving is the problem, not the memory. Because sometimes you do have in, in, in the Vedic tradition or even today's uh, Brahmanic or whatever is left over, like Hindu tradition, yogic tradition, where they would want to shut down the senses, the mind to come to standstill so you do not feel anything. We have the perfect sutta for that in the Indriya Bhavana Sutta, which is sutta number 152 of the Majjhima Nikaya, where Lord Buddha says, that is crazy to expect that by you closing the eyes so you don't see the thing that's somehow going to save you. So you're saying a blind person is already saved? They don't see any of the things that you see. So it's not the seeing nor the object that you're seeing that is the problem, including memories. So I hope this is becoming more um, clear as, as, as we go on. And how do you tie yourself to hopes or be anxious about what may lie in the future? By hoping with delight and passion for the eyes to make contact with pleasing or enjoyable visible objects and sights in the future. So I'm going to now 
uh, abbreviate, even though the whole thing I've written them, you know, separately. And again, they are available on the website. Please print it out, go step by step with them because my throat is hurting. That's why I want to, uh, because there's a repetition here. By hoping with delight and passion for the ears to make contact with pleasing or enjoyable sounds in the future. As a result, there arises consciousness that is bound up with delight and passion for such sounds. So now the person is becoming anxious, tied to not the past, but the hope for something to be happening in a certain way in the future. So you live holding yourself back. You're not living fully because you're afraid that, oh, if I take this step, what if this happens? What if that happens? So now you're living in fear, but at the same time, there's also the hope that something positive will happen. So now you're caught between like, a rock and a hard place. Perfect example of agitated mind. Anxiety. Because what this means is you are not in control. Well, of course, you're never going to be control, in control of the outside conditions. That's why I say everything outside the breath is outside. Your breath. Even your breath might stop. But your relationship to the breath, or any object of meditation, by the way, but the breath is integral, viscerally there with the body. And if it's not there, you're dead. If you're with the breath, unless you're talking about, you know, fourth jhana and above, but when we are trying to live through life, everything outside the breath is outside is external to you. They're not under your control. Okay, so let life be life and let me have a relationship with life through my breath by being present or my body and seeing how the body's going through its various sensations, including when I just had that memory come in because I smelled something that reminded me of my uh, the grandmother I had, let's say how she would bake something. The special dough that she would prepare with cheese and this and that, or, or how she would make apricot jam, how she would boil it and this and that. It was a big process. I could smell it from a mile away and I would know. Okay, but what is it doing to my mind? Am I lost in the memory or am I in the presence of the body? By hoping with delight and passion for the nose to make contact with pleasing or enjoyable smells and fragrances in the future, just like I was referring to. By hoping with delight and passion for the tongue to make contact with pleasing or enjoyable flavors and tastes in the future. By hoping with delight and passion for the body to make contact with pleasing or enjoyable touches and tactile experiences in the future. By hoping with delight and passion for the mind to make contact with pleasing or enjoyable thoughts, ideas, and other mental states in the future. As a result, there arises consciousness that is bound up with delight and passion for such mental states, which traps one into nostalgia and longing for pleasurable experiences to reoccur in the future. In this manner, you tie yourself to hopes or be anxious about what may lie in the future. Therefore, Bhikkhu, it is in this way that one ties oneself to hopes or becomes anxious about what may lie in the future. So that is what Lord Buddha is saying you shouldn't do. <laughs> and how do you not tie yourself to hopes or be anxious about what may lie in the future? By not hoping with delight or passion uh, for the eyes to make contact with pleasing or enjoyable visible objects and sights in the future. As a result, the consciousness does not arise that would otherwise be bound up with delight or passion for such sights. And thus, one does not get trapped in the nostalgia or longing for the pleasurable experiences to reoccur in the future. In this manner, you do not tie yourself to hopes or be anxious about what may lie in the future. So this would be another way of using, uh, in, in uh, psychology, there's the term projecting. So you're not projecting anything. But unfortunately, the whole enterprise of living in a modern world today 
is about projection. We're constantly projecting our fears. And of course, it's being induced. We're coerced to think about the worst case scenarios. And there are gauges. They have standards. They have ways of seeing how well they are manipulating the emotions, the feelings of people, what they constantly think about. Most of the cameras that you see on modern metropolitan cities, in fact, have sensors that could read the you know, infrared cameras and other sophisticated ones. They could read the temperature fluctuations on your face, your, your pupils, your lips. From that, I'm not even talking about body language. They far advanced beyond that. From the temperature fluctuations, they know what emotional state you're in. This is, this is common knowledge. And if they see happy people, they don't like it. That's why they need to put out more and more fear-mongering, fear scenarios, fearful movies, things. Oh, worst. What we, how can you develop in your meditation in such a world? Nobody considers these things. No, no, go sit and meditate, Johnny. Sit there. You know, you have to push through. Yeah, but we have to look at the other factors. We need to protect ourselves from such things, such influences. Because you might be doing everything that Lord Buddha is saying, but you are not protecting your body. You are not protecting what you're exposed to constantly. So it's very important for you to think of the other aspects of protection other than sila. Sila, unfortunately, in this world is not enough if you're living in a major society. So it's important for you to bear these things in mind. Protecting the body, protecting the mind, protecting your feelings, your emotions. By not hoping with delight or passion for the ears to make contact with pleasing or enjoyable sounds in the future. By not hoping with delight or passion for the nose to make contact with pleasing or enjoyable scents and fragrances in the future. By not hoping with delight or passion for the tongue to make contact with pleasing or enjoyable flavors and tastes in the future. By not hoping with delight or passion for the body to make contact with pleasing or enjoyable touches and tactile objects in the future by not hoping with delight or passion for the mind to make contact with pleasing or enjoyable thoughts, ideas, and other mental states in the future. As a result, the consciousness does not arise that would otherwise be bound up with delight or passion for such mental states. And thus, one does not get trapped in the nostalgia or longing for the pleasurable experiences to reoccur in the future. In this manner, you do not tie yourself to hopes or be anxious about what may lie in the future. Therefore, Bhikkhu, it is in this way that one does not tie oneself to hopes or become anxious about what may lie in the future. And how do you uh, falter and get pulled into whatever arises in the present? Bhikkhu, when the eyes and visible objects arise together in the present, if there is delight and passion for pleasing or enjoyable visible objects and sights, then the consciousness that follows becomes bound up by delight and passion taking pleasure in what is being seen, becoming engrossed in it. In this manner, you, you falter and get pulled into whatever arises in the present. So this is in answer to those individuals who say, forget about the past, forget about the future, just suck the juice of the present moment. Be in the present, be here now type of a thing. If you've been on this path, chances are at one point or another, we've all gone through some stage, some book that we read where that's what the author or guru or somebody was, was encouraging. I mean, here Lord Buddha's saying it flat out that that's equally bad. Because you have just lost yourself in whatever is happening. You go and ask a person who is completely an emotional wreck if they are present. You ask a person who's lost in pleasure or in anger. Ask them if they 
know what the present is? They will say, absolutely. Don't be surprised when they say it's quite exhilarating when I am in a moment of rage, break things and be this. And where, where is Sati? Out. It's actually left the country. Back in the day when I used to uh, do, uh, well, practicing and, and studying uh, in stage acting, and uh, we would prepare the mind, prepare the mind with emotions. So it was called emotional uh, preparation. The instructor would never allow us to say emotional prepping. It was a taboo. He would kick us out of the school. So the whole point was to really be in the present. And uh, one day I went to him and I asked him, I'm having a perplexing uh, experience. He said, what's wrong? And, and I was advancing pretty quickly through the courses. And, uh, and I said, I'm having a problem negotiating these two worlds. And he's like, what, what, what are you referring to? And I said, my meditation. And my practice of the Dhamma, which is Buddhism, I explained to him what I was referring to. And then this, doing stage work and all that, and being in the moment with the fellow actors and being alive. And he says, oh. He said, I said, because my, the mind is becoming agitated. There's a problem. But when I am living this character, breathing life into this character, becoming this character on stage, in this play, for example. Forget about not being agitated. I am fully engrossed in it. And Lord Buddha here he says, you shouldn't become engrossed in the living present moment. That's a perfect example of identification with that experience. Whether it's engrossed in lamentation, lost in pain, losing someone you love. That's equally as bad as being or resuscitating in the past or being anxious about the future. So all three of these times, one is worse than the other, so long as they are not being used properly. So by the way, you know, I think I mentioned this before, uh, I quit uh, acting altogether. And I told him as to why, and he was disappointed, uh, the, the instructor, but because uh, I didn't have any more of those dilemmas to deal with. I didn't want to have the mind, the heart become agitated. And then everything became clearer. Anyhow, uh, and when the nose and fragrances arise together in the press, uh, present, if there is delight and passion for pleasing or enjoyable smells, again, I'm going to abbreviate, when the tongue and flavors arise together in the present, if there is delight and passion for pleasing flavors, when the body and touches arise together in the present, if there is delight and passion for pleasing or enjoyable tactile experiences, and when the mind and thoughts or mental states arise together in the present, if there is delight and passion for pleasing or enjoyable mental states, then the consciousness that follows becomes bound up by delight and passion, taking pleasure in what is being mentally experienced, becoming engrossed in it, in this manner, you falter and get pulled into whatever arises in the present. This is uh, one of the reasons why we have sila. And sila uh, also includes you um, avoiding certain circumstances, certain individuals from your life, certain habits. I just gave the example from my personal life years earlier from when I long before I became a monk, of course, of, of acting, doing plays, I realized that was not my world. It was contrary to what I really felt strongly about. So similarly here, you don't need to be placing yourself in a dangerous environment so that you practice sila. That would be stupid. Why place yourself in that position? If you have friends who drink alcohol, or uh, like to spend all night outside, go out to the, you know, to parties, this and that, and you're practicing sila, 
but somehow for whatever reason you like to associate to go with them to spend time yeah one day i didn't drink alcohol i didn't yeah but everybody else around you were i didn't swear i didn't do this i didn't yell i didn't fight i didn't get into a fight yeah but others are living in that state so who's at fault you are because you're placing yourself in harm's way so that you sharpen your sila no that's that would be stupid in this dumb man's discipline why because we need to protect before we get to that point that's why the first um, uh, verses from the uh, mangala sutta is all about that to associate with the wise not the fool how to know that oh i can't associate with the foolish that is a big mangala that is a big great wonderful blessing to have And how, Bhikkhu, do you not falter as you remain immovable, steadfast, and discerning with insight, maintaining the course of wisdom with whatever arises in the present? Bhikkhu, when the eyes and visible objects arise together in the present, if there is neither delight nor passion for pleasing or enjoyable visible objects and sights, then the consciousness that follows is free, neither bound up by delight nor by passion. Therefore, not taking pleasure in what is being seen, nor becoming engrossed by it or pulled into it. In this manner, you do not falter. Instead, you remain immovable, steadfast, and discerning with insight, maintaining the course of wisdom with whatever arises in the present. Lord Buddha would be invited to so many lunches. You know, he would be eating food that are presented or usually given to kings and royalty. Lord Buddha would be eating, let's say, the day before, maybe gruel, maybe some type of rice and basic, basic curry, if they had any. Somebody, you know, offered as he was going on Pindapada. And the next day, he would be sitting with the royals, eating the finest of milk rice and the curries and all kinds of meats and this and vegetables. The whole shebang, the whole... Lord Buddha wouldn't go and say, ah, oh, now this is food. This is a good curry. This is the good biryani, not like what we had yesterday. You will never hear Lord Buddha even have an expression. His mind would not even, you know, register differently. This is what he, we, I understand at least, when Lord Buddha says uh, not to be delighting. Uh, or taking pleasure in whatever is being offered. Because when you take pleasure, it also indicates that you're also taking pain when the pleasure-causing factors are not present. So now you're fighting with the situation. Your conditions are not pleasant for you. So what happened, essentially? The mind became agitated. So this is not a place for you to sit down and argue with yourself and say, you know, I'm not supposed to have pleasure. Yeah, but look at this food. This is great. There isn't that argument. There isn't that fighting going on with yourself, within yourself at all. Uh, of course, you understand Lord Buddha's senses were there 100%. Um, Brahma Sutta is a perfect example where we have point by point uh, record keeping. Um, by Uttara, the, bhikkhu, uh, the, the, sorry, the, the young Brahmin who spent over seven months with Lord Buddha, uh, logging every single thing that he saw happening with Lord Buddha, including how he took food. Whether the food had salt or not salt, not any salt, uh, he would eat and he wouldn't go, give me some salt over there. You would never see that. So there is an acknowledgement. You're not a, a, a mannequin. You're not a machine. You're not a, a plastic. You are aware of what's happening, but you're even more concerned with what's happening in the mind, in the heart, in the chitta. That's where awakening, that's where liberation happens, not in the quality of the food, 
but the quality of the mind tasting the food, that's what's matter, what's important. That's why we can remember Lord Buddha's words that there's awakening even at the tip of the tongue. He says, imagine you're eating food, but there's a razor blade in the morsel of food that you put in your mouth. How will you eat that morsel of food? Will you eat it absent-mindedly with asati? While you're looking over there, watching a game? Oh, yeah. Or you're fully present. And we know also how Lord Buddha, from that earlier sutta I mentioned, every grain of rice would be touched with his sati before it went down in his throat, before he swallowed it. He would know when the grain of rice touched the palate, the teeth, the sides of his mouth, the tongue, chewed and then swallowed. That is why he would take his time rolling the morsel of food in his mouth. Talk about sati. Um, and when the ears and sounds arise together in the present, if there is neither delight nor passion for pleasing or enjoyable sounds, then the consciousness that follows is free. Excuse me. And when the nose and fragrances arise together in the present, if there is neither delight nor passion for pleasing or enjoyable smells, then the consciousness that follows is free. And when the tongue and flavors arise together in the present, if there is neither delight nor passion for pleasing or enjoyable flavors, then the consciousness that follows is free. And when the body and touches arise together in the present, if there is neither delight nor passion for pleasing or enjoyable tactile experiences, then the consciousness that follows is free. And when the mind and thoughts or mental states arise together in the present, if there is neither delight nor passion for pleasing or enjoyable mental states, then the consciousness that follows is free, neither bound up by delight nor pa by passion, therefore not taking pleasure in what is being mentally experienced or cognized, nor becoming engrossed by it or pulled into it. In this manner, you do not falter. Instead, you remain immovable, steadfast, and discerning with insight, maintaining the course of wisdom with whatever arises in the present. It is in this manner, Bhikkhu, that one does not falter, as one remains immovable, steadfast, and discerning with insight, maintaining the course of wisdom with whatever arises in the present. Remember here, Lord Buddha's instruction to Bahia Daru Chidya. He said, uh, When you see, just seeing. When sensing, there is just sensing. Sute sutamattang, when there's when you're hearing, there's just hearing. Vinyate vinyatamattang, when there is cognizing or knowing, there's just a knowing of a thought, this and that. You don't get pulled in, weaved, engrossed by whatever it is that you're experiencing. That is how we understand being with sati in this Dhamma and discipline. Therefore, Bhikkhu, do not resuscitate the past, nor tie yourself to hopes or be anxious about what may lie in the future. For the past is over and done with, while the future has not yet arrived. However, those things that keep arising in the present, he goes on discerning them all with penetrating insight while they occur. He, this he, that personal pronoun, uh, third person, is in reference to the arahant. This is not a putujjana that Lord Buddha's or the deva Chandana was referring to in saying the Baddekaratta Sutta, uh, the verse. They are uh, referring to the arahant through and through. He maintains the course of wisdom steadfast. Today is the time for the work to be done. Tomorrow it may very well be too late as death may or might already be here. For no bargain can be struck with death and its mighty armies. But for him who lives working untiringly both day and night, it is he whom the tranquil sage has called the ideal lover of solitude. And the tranquil sage here is in reference to the Buddha. This is what the Blessed One said. The Venerable Loma Sakangiya's heart was utterly gladdened and filled with much joy and delight. 
as he carefully listened to the instruction given to him by the great teacher himself. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. It is not by chance. It is not by luck. Um, or good fortune that we end up experiencing freedom. It is by shunning of laziness, getting rid of negligence, getting rid of heedlessness, that the work gets done. It is with action, our attitude, how much you're putting into this practice, that's what you're going to get. Like it's, it's, it's like that in any endeavor, right? In our lives, anything worth writing home about, anything worth talking about. So the same thing here with the Dhamma. If you want to improve your life through the Dhamma, it is not by reading and reading and reading and not living what you're reading about, what you're listening to. You need to practice. You need to experiment these principles and see what does that mean when Lord Buddha says, when sensing, just sense. When hearing, just hear. When seeing, just see. What does that mean? Next time you see something really impactful that grabs your attention, pulls you, watch yourself watching it being taken for a ride by it and say what's going on and see if you can maintain i wouldn't say necessarily an aloof state but not so engrossed by the thing you're looking at and see if it's something or someone attractive fine penetrate the skin by half a centimeter the most attractive portion of that person's body just a millimeter through the skin peel the skin go in it get next to the visceral fat adipose fat go into the joints look at the bones this very attractive person or the car you maybe you like the car or something penetrate yeah, but look how great it is, this and that. Or money, or wealth, or prestige. Some, anything that pulls you, or angers you. Emotionally, you get irritated. All these things have to do with you becoming more and more of a lover of the ideal lover of solitude. Solitude here does not mean, as I was saying in the beginning, becoming secluded from everyone else, becoming like an introvert. This is not it. Lord Buddha is not referring to such a person. I've had individuals who were very identified with well, I'm an introvert, as if it's something better than an extrovert. I used to believe that growing up in, as a teenager. I was like, oh, yeah, I'm an introvert. I'm special. No, you're not. You're just as messed up as the others. So here, seclusion or solitude is not necessarily physical because here Lord Buddha is referring to the mental state and that is in solitude of the Arahant. You put this person in the midst of a crowd in the New York City or in Calcutta, in the middle of the busy, busy time in the year, and they're still in solitude. They're not shaken by whatever you throw at them. Because you might have a person, and, and we come across these in countless suttas, in the Nikayas, individuals who go into the wilderness, into the jungle to practice. 
The birds run away from them. That's how messy their minds are, their hearts are. There's no solitude there in their kuti. So solitude itself is not what's being referred to in the Badhe Karatta. It's the solitude of your mind, of your attitude. You could be in the midst of company visiting you or at work, but you could be in a serene kuti inside of your heart. That is what the challenge here is. And that is what your meditation will take you to, to experience more and more, more and more, more and more. So I hope this, uh, uh, this sutta uh, really helps in giving you better bearing, I guess, bearings of, of you know, establishing you in the, in the right direction uh, and then maintain that course. So it is, it is such a wonderful sutta uh, because of the instruction in it. You know, we see it today. We see it over the last few hundred years and different literature around the world where people have started talking about you know don't dwell on the past don't dwell in the future this and that now you see where they got it from so it's so powerful it's so unique that unlike any other sutta any other verse it's boom right by next to each other four of them stacked up in the very important section of the Majjhima Nikaya, Middle Length Discourses. So I encourage you to go back to this and the other ones. So the first one, by the way, uh, was uh, Lord Buddha giving the instruction to the bhikkhus, Badde Karata Sutta. The second one is Ananda Badde Karata Sutta, where Venerable Ananda is explaining it to the bhikkhus, having heard it from Lord Buddha himself. Next is Mahakachana Badde Karata Sutta, which is the one that I was referring to that we've covered here. I forgot, I think it might have been a year or two ago. And then this one, Loma Sakangiya Badde Karata Sutta. And we understood as to who was that protagonist, the deva in the background who was coming in and instigating, kind of getting the fire started in Loma Sakangiya. Hey, go ask Lord Buddha. Because he was living his promise to his friend. Because his wish was, gee, I wish I end up coming back one day and end up being the one who reminds you of this Badde Karata. And he lived true to that promise. Even though Loma Sakangi had forgotten about it. So that's one of the advantages of being a deva, I guess. So I will stop here and see if there are any uh, comments, questions. Bhante? Yes, Siha, go ahead. I have a question. So I've been listening to uh, the sutta and I'm wondering as a lay follower uh, and on the practical side of things, how do I say enjoy correctly for example eating ice cream i hope that uh i hope the question is clear enough <laughs> to uh everyone what flavor <laughs> chocolate obviously <laughs> <laughs> okay uh if you go uh, uh, and you're, you're, let's say you're somewhere where you, it's your favorite ice cream. I guess they call, used to call it parlor or gelateria. If you're in somewhere, they sell gelato. But for some reason or other, some ruthless group of other fellow human beings came by before you and finished your favorite, favorite bucket of chocolate ice cream and left you with none. So having the money in your pocket and knowing, let's say, let's presume that there are no ice cream sellers on the, in the neighborhood left. If you're practicing this, how would you approach? And then granted that there are other buckets, let's say the lemon or the 
other flavors uh, are there intact. There's mango, basil, there's uh, stracciatelle, there's this, there's vanilla, there's mango, there's pineapple. And, but the chocolate bucket is empty, which you took the bus, took the train, drove, found a very difficult parking space to park your car and walked three and a half blocks to get to, only to find out that it is done, empty. What would you do, see how? Well, uh, to be honest, I'd, I'd be quite disappointed. Um, and I would try to make the best of the situation. Okay. So, I would look around and say, okay, maybe there's another flavor that I like. Maybe not as much as chocolate, but you know, mm -hmm. I'll get some of it and then and enjoy it as much as possible. But I suppose the disappointment would would be there. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless. Uh -huh. yeah. so, so here the encouragement is to observe. By the way. The Dhamma has nothing to do with the chocolate, with the ice cream, with the cellar, with how many blocks you walk. None of those things really have much to do with the main message that we see here being presented in the sutta and all the other suttas, for that matter. The key thing, the word or the state that you describe, the disappointment is the magic, the magic state, the, the one that really we need to hone in on, we need to focus upon. Because disappointment means there's a neglect of anicca. There is definitely dukkha, which you eloquently stated and, and cam camouflaged it as disappointment. There might even be rage there, you know, especially when you're seeing the other person over there who is just one person but ended up getting two cones instead of one and they don't have somebody else waiting for them it's for them and your eyes saw that and it's like come on talk about greed i mean you could have at least left me one single cone a baby cone even i would be happy you're walking away i can the point is i need to come back to myself it's like this is simply milk sugar water some fat, some maybe food coloring. That's it. Which, by the way, once I consume, I won't be even consuming. I would be just pushing it down my throat because I got it. And then it's going to go down the tubes and it's going to come out from the other end as poop. Just give it a few hours, maybe. So what is this whole shebang? What is this whole uh, thing about, really? So you see how pregnant this disappointment, state of disappointment is in the context of giving you so much freedom. You could attain Nibbana at the ice cream parlor in front of the chocolate bucket that's empty. That's what you could turn this situation into. If you see, hmm, yeah, I will. Yeah, I was looking. The whole week I was waiting for this. I was working overtime to get early to this point, and here I am, and it's empty. Come on, universe. I never seem to get my whatever. See, the earlier I was talking about outside conditions. The Dhamma has nothing to do with the outside conditions. It has everything to do with you, Siha, experiencing what you're experiencing. That is authentic. It has nothing to do with the chocolate. The chocolate did its job and it did it beautifully because it is now empty and you're feeling rage, perhaps, even. Disappointment. Hurt. Neglected. Abandoned. So what's happening is the old issues come up. Well, yeah, my brothers used to eat. My mom used to give them the bigger scoop. I would never get the chocolate. Here. Never, never, never. Here is that that might have been 27 years ago. What happened there? Resuscitating the past. 
And it never stops there, by the way. They're very much connected. It's the opposite pole of the stick. When you resuscitate the past, what you're also doing is you're dealing with the other pole, which is having to do with the future. So a person who's very uh, prone to depression or feeling like they're being squeezed, being given the short end of the stick, as the, as the saying goes in English, they're going to turn around and say, oh, it always happens to me. So this is another word that we you know, use in therapy. It's all or nothing thinking. Very black and white. Or uh, you generalize, overgeneralization. And somebody else comes and says, uh, you do know that you bought a whole bucket and you have it in the freezer at home, right? From the same place. Yeah, but it tastes much better if I have it here. I like the ambiance, this and that. So you see the plays, the games that we play, but the disappointment is what we neglect to pay attention to or any, any emotion. You just use the word disappointment. So if you were to take Lord Buddha's message to Bahia Daruchirya, you would say, Bahia, when seeing the bucket of ice cream empty, you see it empty. And that's it. It has nothing to do with your emotion. Maybe hungry school children came in from Zimbabwe. They were so hungry and they didn't have food or bread or something. And the person offered them free. Take the bucket. Take all the buckets. And the kids are hungry for the first time they're eating sugar. And you turn around and you see them, they're so in tears with joy. You're not going to think about your disappointment. You're going to be exhilarated equally. Why? Because your mudita is through the roof because you're so happy that other human beings are now not dying of hunger. Same bucket. What happened? Scenario shifted. How is this working so far? Usable or no? <laughs> yeah, it's it's uh, it's 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 usable. It's it's essentially, if I'm understanding you correctly, it's about having sati about what's going on inside you, no matter what. Um, when I asked that question, I was thinking more of the the other way, I suppose it's, it's still the same advice it would give me, which is, uh, let's say I go to the same ice cream parlor and I do get my favorite chocolate ice cream. Uh -huh. And, you know, what's what's the right way mm -hmm. to enjoy it? So, uh, and if, I'm, if, I, if I heard you correctly, then it would be, yes, I can enjoy the ice cream. And at the same time, still, uh, watch what's going on inside of me. Mm. I'm not going to lie and, you know, and, 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 and say, you know, I'm going to be able to do that, like, you know, perfectly. Of course not. <laughs> but, but yes, I, I do understand uh, your point. So thank you, Bandit. Mm -hmm. Of course. Uh, what I would simply add a caveat to that, just the, 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 given that you presented while you were thinking about this approach, Bhante, you said, yes, absolutely, as far as the enjoyment part, and you did get your chocolate, okay? Uh, something that happens uh, in, 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 in engendering within you this, this, this sense of appreciation. Let's say, let's presume it's hot, scorching hot outside, and you enter the ice cream a parlor and they have air conditioning outside it's like 100 percent humidity terrible and it's hot you know in the 40s centigrade so you come in and it's like oh my i don't know who invented the air conditioning thank you thank you thank you and then you go over there and you see the ice cream bucket the chocolate your favorite one and you see there's plenty of it and the person asks what I, know, I like to get a cone. No, no, make it a, a bigger cup, okay? How many scoops? Three, four, five, however many you want. And you start, and then you see over there, uh, somebody over there, they, they can barely afford maybe one. And there's two of them or three of them. Say, what, what are they getting? 
I don't know, let's ask. And you offer them a couple of cones of their favorite. And you're eating here and they're eating there. Thanks to you, compliments of Siha, making them taste. So I guarantee you that chocolate is going to taste divine. Much better than the person who intended in creating that recipe for the chocolate had in mind. And on top of that, you say, wow, somebody invented this chocolate. Thank you. They might have been dead and gone about 100 years ago. So what you're doing is you're being thankful. You're actually appreciating while you're tasting. So that also pulls you out from becoming engrossed in it. So what you're feeling now is joy. Suddenly, you're not supposed to, for, you know, because you're not practicing Brahma Viharas, but you're full of the Brahma Viharas. Suddenly, the mind drops into equanimity. The fourth Brahma Vihara. You might even enter a jhana while sitting in a ice cream parlor. You see, the Dhamma is not supposed to be only practiced, lived, enjoyed, tasted on the meditation cushion or on a retreat. It's supposed to be everywhere you go, everything you touch every experience you have, not just the satisfying ones or the ones where everything goes perfectly, like this scenario. But when you see the empty bucket of chocolate ice cream, many of the bhikkhus would return back to the monastery with empty bowls. We don't hear that about that in the suttas. Some places you have to dig. You have to look for them here and there, but they're there. There were years like that in a bhikkhu's life where they felt they were emaciated. They weren't getting enough sustenance. They didn't have enough place or a place for them to live. That doesn't mean they need to be disrobing and leaving. And some, many people did. Don't get me wrong. Forget about this. This is hell. What is this? I can attain Nibbana as, as a lay person which is true, but that's not why they became bhikkhus. So uh, you can turn it around, but you need to have sati to see what's going on first. Maybe, maybe even visualize. This always helps, actually, when you're really perplexed. Visualize Lord Buddha or Venerable Sariputta or Venerable Ananda standing right next to you at that ice cream parlor. And you're looking, you're about to go, oh, it's empty. And Venerable Sariputta is standing right next to you. What would you say? What would you do? Of course, he's not going to go, I like some of that, like some of that. They're, unless you are their student, they won't ask. But if you are their kapi or their student, they might ask you, you know, it's hot, uh, maybe some of that lemon, kapiya or upasaka. And you're not going to say, yeah, but Bhante, the chocolates, that's what I wanted you to eat. You're not going to say that. You're going to make the most of it and reach for something else. And whether it's cauliflower ice cream or turnip ice cream, they don't care. They will take it. As long as, you know, they're, they're open for it, that is. So play these games. There's not, there's not a rule that says you cannot because you are trying to pull back the 747 that's going berserk, that's going off the runway. Those are all your baser instincts. Wrong view that we all have come from with. So your sati has to become so strong that you can nail it down by using different tools. And that's why we're exploring all these suttas to see and to put ourselves in different scenarios and say, hmm, I wonder how I can approach it if this happens in the future again. So do you feel like you, you can use some of this? Yes, Mante, that was, that was uh, quite applicable, <laughs> I might say. So 
<laughs> Good. <laughs> Thank you. I'm glad. I'm glad. Uh, any other thoughts, questions before we conclude for the day? Dante, hello. Yes, Nico. Hello. Thank you for your talk. Thank you very much. Um, I, have a, I have a quick question on the um, sixth section of the sutta we just talked about, or you mm. just talked about. Mm. Um, it's, let me try to get it up here. Um, and I wonder, I, throughout the text, I always wondered what consciousness is this referring to? And I don't have the Pali, I di didn't look it up, but, but you might know it. So in, in the sixth section, um, where the mind is without craving, and when the mind and thoughts or mental states arise together, if there is neither delight nor passion for pleasing or enjoyable mental states, mm -hmm. then the consciousness that follows is free. So um, I am wondering if is this contact, is this a close up look on contact that we are, that, that, that is described here. So there's the, uh, the object, and then there's a perception of the object, and then there's the consciousness that arises with it, which the three things, when they come together, that's called pasa, contact. Is, is this what, is, what it's talking about? It, was yeah. that clear? Yes, did, you, did, you, could, you could approach. I hesitated if you noticed, because... Yeah. Uh, no, I didn't. Oh, well, the short answer to your question, it would be yes. For the Arahant, because this is in reference to the Arahant. And Lord Buddha, if you notice, with all three time periods that he was going over, one with the resuscitation of the past, there mm -hmm. was a method that the Putujana follows, and the one that the noble disciple, or in this case, the Arahant follows, in reference to the resuscitation or not resuscitation. So that was the first time. The second time involved the future, right? So somebody mm -hmm. who does not, uh, who does, excuse me, uh, get anxious because they're tied to some outcome in the future. And then you have the Arahant who does not have mm -hmm. that tying up with a future outcome. So that would be the second time. The third time involved the present tense, which also one is dealing with the Putujana state of mind, and that is being sucked into, engrossed in that living experience in the present. And then the Arahant's relationship to that same present would be just like mm -hmm. we were talking about, let's say, Bahya Daruchivya, where he saw and just let it be at the seeing. Mm -hmm. So here, uh, the hesitation was in regards to Anidasana Vinyana. Uh, or non-manifestative non consciousness. That is one attribute of this. But in the case of a living, breathing arahant who is engaged in life, who's not in that state, let's say, in deep, deep arahatapala, for example, but they are engaged and they are tasting the ice cream. They're just tasting the ice cream. So... Sati is so strong. In fact, there's nothing else. There's mm -hmm. Yoniso Manasikara, because Yoniso Manasikara is seeing things for what they are. What this is also in Pali is Yatabhutang Pajanati, but this is not an insight that happens every once in a while which might happen, let's say, in, in, in the Vipassana state, here and there, when you're on a retreat. This is the ongoing state of such a mind. Mm. This is an Arahant's state. That's why he is the ideal lover of solitude, because he is leaving one room, going to the next. He's not carrying the remnants of what he saw, felt, tasted in this room with him. He's there. But if you go asking, scratching the surface, he knows, remembers, he's not amnesiac. He knows what happened here too. But he left it here because he's there in the other room. 
So this is how uh, one of the suttas that I was translating yesterday from the the group, the first group, the first group of ten. I officials start with the translations in the Sangyutta Nikaya from the beginning. One of them, the Deva comes in and asks Lord Buddha, how is it that your bhikkhus, we see them in the jungle, in the wilderness. They eat one meal a day. They're living in very meager ways, in a kuti that's leaking, at least a kilometer away from a village. No companions, but they're glowing. How is that possible? They're glowing like devas. What is the thing? What, what is, what, how is that happening? And Lord Buddha gives them the, basically, in his way of living just like this ideal lover of solitude, where they do not have sticky fingers with memories. Because these six sense doors are so powerful. They have this sticky quality to them. If there is no sati, if there is no yoni somanasikara. Now, why yoni somanasikara? Why yoni? Yoni means the place of origin. Think of it like the matrix, the mother of the experiencing of life. Yoni. Manasikara. Doing with the mind, placing the mind onto that place of the matrix, the mother, the origin. What is that? Place of contact. Hasa. So every single six, one of the six sense doors is the place for the exact place where Yoni Somanasikara has to be. Unfortunately, for most of us, we just let the six senses do their thing. There is no Yoni Somanasikara. And Lord Buddha, because I mean, the reason why he became Lord Buddha, he became, he saw the Dhamma, he attained Nibbana, was because he figured it out. He understood the role of Yoni Somanasikara. Because up until that point, it was Ayoni Somanasikara. This is where we have the sense of Atta, the self, myself. I like the ice cream bucket of chocolate to be there. I. Why? Because I, I, I miss it. I like the taste of chocolate. But now I'm disappointed. So all my six sense doors now in a turmoil. Why? Because there's no Ioni Somanasikara. It's all Ioni Somanasikara. Because I'm trying to resuscitate the past and I am trying to attach myself to a future which now is distraught. I'm completely disappointed because I wasted my life coming all the way here and seeing an empty ice cream bucket. I'm going to go home miserable without my ice cream. The whole neighborhood doesn't have ice cream anymore. What am I going to do? So, of course, the image, the example, it might seem grotesque, but it doesn't matter for the mind. How is this so far? Do you, do you, is this helping? Uh, yes, yes, so, somehow, yes, it, it is. Maybe it has to sink in more. Um, what I find um, um, in, very interesting is that although tanha craving is um, mentioned in the uh, paticca samuppada, in the dependent origination at a certain place, but this is an example for how it is, I don't know, between the lines described that Tanha is right there with every link of dependent origination in it. And when you take it out, the consciousness that arises, there's no suffering that comes from it. There's no, it's not the region of, of future suffering. This is Absolutely. really like an epiphany and uh, to find it in the suttas. I've heard Absolutely. people talking about it. I've maybe experienced it myself, others did so and reported of it, but see it in the suttas in between the lines. That's very interesting. It's very, very nice. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, 
Lord Buddha was very generous to give us 12 links of Paticca Samuppa. He didn't have to. He didn't have to. In other suttas, you have much less numbers. The other day yeah. we did one, uh, not the Samudaya Sutta, another sutta we did where it was nine links. Mm -hmm. But if you go into looking at each of the links, you see that the four noble truths are inside each of the links. And what's inside? What's the second noble truth? The presence of tanha. Mm -hmm. So if you remove tanha, that link, it's a link. So yeah. who cares which part of the Paticca Samuppada links you pull out? The moment you cut any of the links, the whole thing falls apart. Yeah. But we, because of our naivete, sometimes we have a thinking that we say, no, 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 no. Tanha has to come before Upadana. Mm -hmm. Ah, so yeah, so it happens to come after, before, after. No, 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 no. Mm -hmm. So these are limitations that are quite unnecessary. This is what happens when we think compartmentally. Boom, boom, like very linear. And the Dhamma is not linear. And in my discoveries, I understood how it is non-linear just like the brain. The biggest part of the brain is the right brain and it's all about relationships. It makes sense of the left brain. The right brain, if you cut it, actually the, the hemispheres, they're not exactly two hemispheres. It's, it's a little bit more lopsided and it covers a little bit more, uh, it occupies more space in the skull because the biggest chunk of our evolution has been with the help of this portion of the brain that understands spatially relationships of ideas. And then when you look at the life of the bhikkhus and bhikkhunis and the arahants and how the Dhamma is interpreted, translated context, you see it's all nonlinear. So you pull back, it allows you, so the Dhamma needs to be seen as you pull yourself back and to get the bigger picture. Yeah. And then you see the connection, oh, so Tanha is inside each link, huh? By the way, Niroda is also inside each link. Really? Yes. Wow. No wonder so many people were becoming Arahants. And so few today in the modern world. It's not the problem with the Dhamma. The Dhamma yeah. is the Dhamma. So, but good, good, uh, good comments there, Nico. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Of course, of course. Um, perhaps uh, um, given that you mentioned that this is an epiphany that you're having now and you need to process and any epiphany we have, I encourage you to really spend some time with it. Maybe go out walking, uh, maybe journal. Journaling is very helpful to write or to record yourself. I was like, what does this mean? What is this in this sutta? Let me go revisit that. And then allow, but don't push, please. Don't force yourself. Don't try to squeeze a round peg into a square hole. <laughs> Just allow, soft. Good, good. Any other thoughts, comments? Mm, good. So let us, uh, if there aren't any, let us uh, transfer some merits. Akasa tachabu mata deva nagama hiddika punyantangan moditva chinangara kantu loka sasanam. Akasa tachabu mata deva nagama hiddika punyantangan moditva chinangara kantu desanam. Akasa tachabu mata deva nagama hiddika punyantangan moditva chinangara kantu mamparanti. May you all be well. May you be protected, especially by you, with your help of sati, watching the mind, watching the heart, protecting yourself and protecting the world as you protect yourself and the mind. May the practice grow. May you attain the highest fruits of this Dhamma and discipline of Lord Buddha. And may the merits be shared with all beings now and in the future.
Until next time. Suki hook. Hmm.